Thank you very much indeed for coming along to the uh, LA meeting. Uh, today we've got uh, Bob talking about uh, Bob Lyson talking about uh, what's wrong with Milton Friedman. Uh, and uh, with that, Bob, I'll hand it over. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, what indeed is wrong with Milton Friedman? Well, he's dead, but and of the departed, one is supposed to say, let us now praise famous men. He is undoubtedly a famous man. Or you could put it as, let us lambast famous men, because as a point of honour, if you think very highly of them, you should try and find some fault in them so they can be improved upon, so that their good work can be made even better. Yes, indeed. Um, uh, or we could have put it as, let us now braise famous men, because to braise is to... Um, cook over live coals in a brazier. So, well, I shan't tell you what's wrong with him just yet. It's polite to say what's quite good about him, and he's very right about him. Oh, there was a man. Yes, that's right. Here he comes. Yes, what's right about him? I suppose, since I have it available, would have a quick, a quick, when and where. Blah, born 1912, to Jewish immigrants in New York City. He attended Rutgers University, where he earned his BA at the age of 20. He went on to earn his MA from the University of Chicago in 1933, and his PhD from Columbia University in 1946. Blah, right, that, that's enough, I think. In what? Uh, in what? In what? Economics, I would hope. <laughs> it could have been, no, it was interior design. <laughs> no, it wasn't economics. <laughs> so, a clever fellow. Um, during the war, he was signed up to do um, sort of econometric stuff. That was part of his war effort. I think somewhere in there, and he, he was ashamed of it later, was he suggested the withholding tax. Uh, we call it the income tax, the pay as you earn income tax. So, in other words, it's simply taken out. We, don't worry about it. Don't worry about giving it later and lying. We're going to take it now. And uh, your employer is going to tell us, your employer is going to tell us the truth about what you're earning at his place. Yes. Um, that's so much. That shouldn't really be included in the what's good. I think it's probably best to shut the door. No, the, or the outer one. No, that one will do. They know where we are. That's better. Yes, I shouldn't really include that in the what's right, because that something he has to apologise about, though it was effective if he was to get uh, money raking in, in uh, during a war. Uh, he was in favour of a volunteer army, a solely volunteer army, paid volunteers. In other words, he was against conscription. That's a very good thing to be against. And he, he helped. He was part of them, the movement that got its way. And they, they, they went to, in fact, a senior general remarked that I don't want people press ganged into, you know, I want people who want to be here and are good at it and pleased to be good at it. He was against tariffs. Uh, he was against licensing. The first, his first um, co-authored work was about the, uh, the evils of licensing and the fact that it, it was, was a constraint on trade and he was opposed to close shops. In Capitalism and Freedom, which in some ways is a better book than um, Free to Choose, he, uh, he really lays into doctors. Now, usually people lay into lawyers because they earn a lot and people don't like them very much. But he lent to doctors who were supposed to be a good thing, um, angels and you know, saints, saints preservers. But he saw that they, um, they quickly rigged the whole thing in their, to their advantage. They, they now have, as with the common agricultural policy in, the, in Europe, we now have um, reserve prices for, for things and um, reduced output, if at all possible, to keep the, uh, the prices up. Though it also applies in this country and in America too, because of um, illegal aid, that is another way of keeping the prices up for um, closed professions. Professions who um, make moves and prevail upon the state to um, protect the public by having um, authorised teachers and authorised universities and authorised colleges and correct degrees and the rest of it, just to keep the numbers down and the, uh, the earnings up. And he saw through all that and he opposed it and that was a good thing too. What else is he good for? Please come in. Well, famously for explaining inflation. You wouldn't have thought it needed much explaining. As um, if people are spending a lot more money, uh, there must be a lot more money to spend. And 
and someone must have made it. And as it wasn't being dug out of the ground and turned into coins, there must have been some other source of this money. And it was, of course, uh, the banking system and behind it, the government or some agent of the government posing as independent but not being so, which, of course, is the Fed in America and the Bank of England over here. So he saw that um, inflation of prices was always and everywhere a result of inflation in money. And this is pretty much accepted now, but at the time it was, it was rather difficult to get the Keynesians to admit to it. I mean, they thought there couldn't be true inflation until everybody was employed, at least a job and a half each. Otherwise, it was, so, it was due to something else. It was um, well, too much money chasing too few goods. So it was, it was the too few goods. The British weren't making enough goods. If they made enough goods, wouldn't, they wouldn't get inflation. That was ridiculous. I mean, if, if, the, if the money printing is uh, extreme enough, you cannot possibly make enough goods to keep the prices stable. And in fact, it usually stops production, it usually hampers production when there is a uh, double digit inflation, let alone um, the hyperinflation. So it's good about expanding inflation. I remember a, a lecture he gave, a public lecture, it was televised, actually, or at least a recording was made and shown, at some college in London, some bear pit of, with the raked auditorium and the, the lectern or the desk at the front. And they were almost howling at him, howling at him in a polite way. How can you say, how can you say? How can you say this? And um, simply as a, a, an interesting point, an illustration of his argument, he said that once the um, Union forces during the American Civil War had captured the, uh, the mint of the, the Confederates, their inflation stopped surprisingly, because they couldn't print any more. And, um, and they held back, the, the, uh, the polite uh, um, auditors in his audience, that, oh, 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 so you want the British Army to go into, to go into the mint? That's your solution, is it? And of course he wasn't saying that. He was saying that's, that's a concrete example of um, what was going on. Anyway, that's now pretty much, pretty much taken for granted. Uh, although sometimes we even get the talk of, um, still get the talk of, overheated demand. We're growing too quickly. That's, that's the reason for the inflation. Pish, if you're growing, if you're growing quickly, prices should fall. Other, other things being equal, yes. if, the money, uh, if the money supply is pretty stable or even fixed, and it will be no harm if it were, mm. or do no harm if it were. So that's, well, that's all good stuff about Milton. Um, less good from an, uh, the Austrian economist's point of view, the a priori lot, Beesians, um, it was his idea that you just, well, you just throw a, you just throw a conjecture up in the air and you, you can have untrue assumptions, it doesn't really matter very much, as long as you're getting predictions out of it that follow properly from your model, and then you compare the predictions to the reality and then say if it's good or bad. And um, I can't say I care much for that. In fact, all of these simplified models, as I put it somewhere, simplified models complicate matters because they're all inadequate and they're all, we're not sure which is, what's going on? What? No. So it, these simplifications complicate the issue. The point is, it is possible to have an understanding with all the complexities in, not in a model, it's, the complexities are, are in reality, but it's possible for the um, analyst, the economist, to say, well, what must be the effect of, well, good old fashioned stuff like increase demand for a product, lower costs for that product, things of that kind. It, it is possible to see that there must be redundancy here, there will be taking on of labour there, there will be rising industries here, there will be declining industries there. All these things can be pretty much predicted and sometimes predicted quite accurately in a broad kind of way. But it's not going to be what the interest rates will be in a year's time perhaps, although the Victorians managed to have 2% interest rates for about 28 years in a row, I think. So it, it's not so difficult, given what, um, <laughs> what politicians are, are doing, or rather not doing, and leaving the economy alone. It might be quite likely that um, settled people with a settled currency, and settled preferences, would have a pretty settled interest rate. There's no reason why it should lurch about, and there's no reason why it should particularly need being predicted. I mean, people would assume it's going to be pretty much the same, and since it was, who needed to predict it in, or at least predict it via a model. So um, many, uh, as I say, Austrian economists, economists and others don't much care for his scientific method. They think that's not the way to deal 
at least with the economics as a social science, there are no fixed ratios or proportions between this and that. There are no fixed coefficients. It's, it's not like chemistry or physics. Not that sort of thing at all. And also unnecessary. If you're simply trying to find out the best set of institutions to leave alone, of course, it might be that there is no set of institutions that can be left alone, that there must be intervention, and there must be modelling, and there must be predicting, and there must be people working the levers. But let us assume that, to start with, that that isn't the case, in which case, if we have a set of institutions that can be pretty much left to do their work, or rather people work within them, then prediction, in a kind of a way, is quite straightforward. Some things will get cheaper, some things you like will disappear from the shops because people don't buy them anymore because they're buying something else. There's more profit in doing that than doing the thing that you liked. I mean, there's all quite sort of... Moving down from broad categories to more precise, it's possible to say... Well, they'll be up to start. They'll be up. From precise to broad, we can say, I was, in the, I was in that pub a year ago, and you had a very lovely beer. Now, of course, it isn't there anymore. The pub may be shut, the beer may be replaced by another one. And you can go through the stages. But if you said, right, London's bound to have somewhere to eat and drink tonight on a Friday if it's a Friday, let's say, and I think you're going to be right. It's going to be quite a severe set of circumstances where there is nothing to be purchased in the way of food or drink in London. And so pattern predictions, now I think I put it that way, pattern predictions are entirely on. Of course, they don't sound like much to an economic model. Well, what can you do with them? What advice can you give to the lever pullers by saying, well, there's going to be somewhere to read, there's going to be somewhere to drink, and there'll be jobs to be got, and there'll be people being married done. Well, why do you need to say more? They're taking it for granted that an economist has to be advising policy makers. They like being called policy makers, not bleeding politicians, which is <laughs> the way I prefer to put it. I'm a policy maker, as I've said before. Hitler, the great policy maker. Stalin, the great policy maker. Ah, I'm a policy maker. You're a policy maker. I'm a policy analyst. Oh, I give policy advice. Oh, I'm a policy maker. They're all, we're all in it together, and no one's on top, and no one's being ground underneath. Uh, the next good thing about him, oh, I, actually the modelling wasn't too good, was it? Oh, we're now moving on to um, things where you may have a view one way or the other. His work on the consumption function didn't do any harm. That was a knock, knock against the Keynesian model. Because Keynes thought, well, if people, if people get more, they spend more. So if you can give them a bonus or cut taxes or print some money and shove it at them, they'll rush out and spend it and that will get the whole thing moving along nicely. And, and uh, he pointed out that if people think, well, this is a one-off sort of gimmick, and what's more, they might tax it back later in a year or two, people are quite likely to not do much different at all, save a bit more, spend a little more, but they, no, it wouldn't have the effect the Keynesians hoped, and that's pretty much been accepted now. That was the permanent income hypothesis, and so it's what you expect to be getting pretty much over the next few years, and this little, this little thing, and they did it in America, didn't they, a little little tax, tax back or tax cut that was done under Bush, I think. Bush the younger, it didn't seem to have much effect. He was opposed to, um, he, he spoke against the uh, Phillips curve. He said it just doesn't, you know, the, the idea there was a permanent trade-off between inflation and unemployment. So you had a bit more inflation, you get a bit less unemployment. And if you had acceptable uninflation and you had acceptable unemployment, then hey, it's wonderful. But of course, within a year or so, you had unacceptable inflation. And, and the unemployment wasn't looking too good either. So he won, he won on that one too. He opposed income policy as a cure for inflation, but then he would, given what he saw the cause of inflation was, utterly, utterly unrelated to the activities of the trade unions. Now, it may look to someone who hasn't done the economics that, you know, there the trade, there's the strikes and trade unions demanding and trade unions getting and the bosses having to meet the demands of the workers and all that, surely that, that's, that's where it comes from. And then everything's, everything's so costly, you have to pay more for it. But how can you pay more without more money? Simply enough, that was, it wasn't, that was sort of stunning insight, eventually. And then they agreed to, because it was so obvious, I mean, no one ever believed otherwise, including people who did believe otherwise, but won't admit to it. Uh, his famous free to choose TV program. Oh, of course, as a as a spokesman for the free market in general, you know, not doing it by the state, not having socialism, not having a central plan. Of course, he was a marvelous thing. He was he was polite. He could talk forever. He could face hostile audiences without losing his temper, which is not easy, I'm sure. 
So these are all good things. Um, the uh, I remember another thing back from the 70s, I think it was the 70s, and this programme Free to Choose was being shown in this country. It was a public broadcasting service, American thing. Could have been 1980, wasn't it? Was it? That late? Could be. Yeah. And um, in this country, the, the programme would be shown, and then various academics and politicians had to rubbish it afterwards. <laughs> Say, don't you ignore all this. So they had some token, you know, liberal, uh, old fashioned liberal in there. Yeah, but they had to do that. You know, it was too shocking to let the public see the thing neat. They had to have a little, little afterward, just so they <laughs> drew the correct um, conclusion, correct, correct moral. Right, that's all pretty good stuff, as I said, apart from the modelling. And now to the what's what's uh, not so right, what's wrong in fact. Uh, what well, he he uh, owned up to the withholding tax. He um. He spoke of the negative income tax. Now, admittedly, he was saying, if you must change incomes via politics, don't do it by making stuff artificially cheap and therefore runs into shortages or there have to be subsidies given to the manufacturers so that they actually earn their normal rate of return and then that has to be politically determined what the normal rate of return should be. So he saw that if you really must do something about incomes, then just, just give it to people who are earning through a negative income tax. Now, of course, this is, this is Gordon Brown, isn't it? And all that. Now, it's another way of taking the, the workload off the, um, uh, off the government and putting on businessmen and not paying them for it, of course, and uh, not getting rid of any, any civil servants as a result for the, the less work they're having to do because um, a lot of these transfers are now being done within, within the pay department of, uh, of the firms. Yeah, Ted Heath took that up for a while, but it didn't save him. He was voted out. Uh, now, the, well, no, another really bad stuff. Um, he was opposed to gold, which is fair enough. He thought we have to dig it out of the ground, and that's costly, and you have to guard it, and that's costly, and you have to move it, that's costly. But, but his real objection was that he was still a kind of Keynesian. He objected to certain things in the Keynesian analysis, but he really was a Keynesian in supposing that you have to, you have to have enough money to buy the stuff which seems very monetary cranky, and in a sense it is, it is, and he wouldn't have put it that way himself, he would have probably have objected to that, but I'm afraid that does very much look like what it is. So the, the costs of gold are part of the benefit. It's like having a, a brick wall to keep a house up. If you walk into it, you know, you hurt your nose. But of course it holds the walls up and the upper stories and keeps it warm inside and things. So in the same way, the costs of gold compared to the costs of having uh, paper money or fiat, or fiat currency, well, they're so far greater for the latter that it hardly matters. It's piffling about, about the other part, which is being dug up anyway because people like it for jewellery or whatever it might, might be, so the mines are there. M make use of them. And of course, another cost of having fiat currency is that fiat currency is going to be a national fiat currency, except possibly the euro, which is a sort of hybrid, but it is um, a fiat currency. It means you don't get a single world currency, which is something much to be desired and easy to obtain. Um, but the reason he was not in favour of a world currency, even if it were a mere fiat currency, is that he probably thought, as people still do, many do, that most economists, I suppose, think that there are just economies. They just are economies. And you can talk about exports and imports and external drains and what have you, but um, they think that these different economies require different policy. And if you're going to advise the policy makers, there must be policy for the country. And they have, so they have their own currencies, and that's no bad thing, because you have to fiddle around with it to make things work. That's, that's their view. That's his view, and uh, many others too. So it wasn't a drawback that there was a national currency and a central bank, and there were different rates of inflation. He said 
he didn't recommend well he actually may have recommended that but what he did what he did say and quite rightly if you're going to have um, currency creation and a national currency and you're going to do it in your own interests as you think best for the national interest or getting re-elected possibly um, don't have a fixed exchange rate because that's just silly because if countries are inflating they're hardly ever deflated but if they're inflating at different rates then there'll be a great strain on the um, on the exchange rate and something would have to give and uh, interest rate might interest rates would have to be jacked up in desperation that usually didn't work because you were making you were pumping out so much money compared to your neighbours that the interest rate wouldn't save the external drain so called or the fact that the people were so rich in one sense in money terms before the pound did Appreciated that they could afford more um, imports. And then, of course, there was a dreadful adverse balance of trade, which was supposed to show how the country was going down like an old ship. It was about time we joined the common market or something. That was, that was part of the reasoning behind it. And it wasn't because it wasn't British Airways were slack or slow or well, no more than I am. <laughs> but the point is, you can be a poor country with a perfectly sound currency. That, that, that's that's relevant. Poverty doesn't make you have means you can't cope with the whole country. You just have it's a lower wage. You have you're low. You know you're less productive. You have lower wages. What's the difficulty? I mean, difficulty is you don't like it, but it's, it's not imposed upon you. It's not something strange and alien. And oh, why is this currency doing it to us? No, no. And you don't make yourself rich by having more of it because it just devalues. So the, there's no advantage that way. So he was right about if you must must have separate rates of inflation in different national economies, so-called. Uh, my view on the economies is that there's only one. It's a world market. I mean, even, even North Korea, there are people making stuff and buying stuff in and looking around the world at various prices and, and motivated to try and leave or murder or do something because they know what's going on in the rest of the world. If you know what's going on and you adjust your behaviour accordingly, your production accordingly, that means, there's, in a sense, there's a world market because it's, there's knowledge and there's action as a result. So what are these uh, so-called national economies? Well, they are, they are subject to peoples, otherwise known as democracies, hands of the free, um, and you're bullied this way and that way, but in a slightly different way, the way that people are being bullied in other countries. So apparently that is, that is wonderful national independence. But there is no real separate economy because people are looking at world markets, there's some degree of trade, or they're, they're trying to escape, which is another form of production, um, saving up to get out. So there's always one world market, <coughs> except possibly for tribes in the um, Amazon rainforest. As an aside, I should say that there's a moral debate about whether you should go actually and tell these people, look, you, you could be living a lot differently, and maybe better. You know, we're not saying it is better. You know, we find it better. But is it is it too invasive to actually go and tell them? Because they occasionally fly over and they said that they wave their fists at the helicopters or something. But it may be that if you went in with some lovely stuff to give to them... It's called for an imperialism. Yes, well, they might be rather grateful <laughs> after a while once <laughs> they realise... That's why they don't like it. That's why they have glasses don't like it. Well, yes. Anyway, that, that, that's, that's one view. That, so those in the rainforest, perhaps they are not in the world economy. Because they're not, for a start, they're not making goods for sale. They're not in the there's no price system there. And um, it doesn't take one world currency to get a one world economy, though it would be better, better for all if there were one world currency, I think. So he thought it was a good thing that, uh, that there was a political management of the money supply. He thought that the money supply has to be accommodating to growth. In other words, it has to grow. Never quite explained why. I mean, the Victorians managed to have a, despite the occasional gold find in Klondike and South Africa, they managed with declining prices. Everyone knew about it. Um, my grandfather, uh, in the 20s or 30s, he simply saved up and bought his house. Well, why not? Now, now it seemed ludicrous. A stupid thing to do. You might as well get into debt and have inflation wash it away. But in those days, it was, you know, that's what you did. Then that's what would happen again. I mean, there's nothing wrong, in a sense, with real borrowing of real savings. I don't have any 
great objection to that, and some some good ideas are so productive that you should pile in there and give your savings to them. <coughs> and they should be indebted, because they're going to have you to pay it back uh, very well. Uh, yes, debt deflation. Uh, and many economists are worried about this, dreadfully, dreadfully perturbed about it. And it's no good thing. People are horribly in debt. And there are minimum wages and regulations and trade union favourings and various other things, such that it's very difficult to get, and a benefit system. So it's difficult to get people to um, just cut the wages they're asking for. I mean, they're not, they're not going to cut the real wages, but to cut the nominal wages. Now, that's not a great problem unless you've had so much inflation for so long that people are not doing as my grandfather and they're getting horribly into debt. That if you're in horribly into debt and you have to cut your nominal wage but still pay the same nominal um, debt off if you can, then that, that can lead to trouble. But uh, well, I've said, some, said to someone, if you, don't, if you don't want it, don't have a concertina economy. In other words, don't have money that can fall back to nothing. You don't need it. So why have it? Um, we could even now, with um, if Bitcoin manages to work properly or something like it, but I can even have an utterly fixed money stock. It wouldn't do any harm at all once you've adjusted to it, lived with it, and prices would, would do what they have to do. But uh, Freeman and many others thought that you have to maintain a nominal demand. Oh, well, I've recommended him before, but if you haven't read it, uh, David Stockman's enormous book on um, the Great Defamation and the coming of crony capitalism to America is extraordinarily good. It is a very badly edited book. It could be much improved and made smoother and a better read. Sure. Well, it's a great read, but I mean, in the mere prose angle, it could have been, and he rushed it out and probably edited it himself. And, but it is a wonderful thing. Uh, of course, I happen to agree with it all, pretty much. But that's because he's right. That's, that, that's if I'm right. So, and he, uh, he points out the, uh, the nonsense of the political management of money supply. He said, he, he seems to be, stop when this is, he seems to be in favour of, a, of a, a central bank. But the central bank, as it was founded, was only intended to allow the market order to get on with what it's doing, and banks could occasionally come and they would have collateral, good collateral, and they could get. They could get money, more reserves, at a penal rate, but not too penal a rate. And that was, a, so it wasn't trying to run the economy, but sometimes the needs of the economy had to be met by a little elasticity, which was built into the system. You know, I don't think that has to be the case. But at least that, there was something to be said, perhaps, for having that kind of central bank. But of course, there's not at all the, the kind we have now. Now it's running the show. Now it's, um, well, it's, is it about to taper? Is it, is it uh, forward guidance? Yes, forward guided missile is going to hit us. Yeah, so that is very, um, very um, a Stockman would would wish. But one, I'm not sure that Friedman wouldn't think it was something in it. He'd want it. He did want to. He, he almost sighed and said, "I wish we could have a computer simply increasing the money supply by a fixed rate, and they couldn't unlock it and change it. It just, it just did it." But Stockman in his book points out that. Um, and I was listening to a podcast by who was the, who was the fellow I'm objecting to? Oh, Scott B. Summer, Sumner, who is a who is a monetarist in this, who, who thinks that it's vitally important to have the nominal GDP targeted by the central bank, and um, and then you get what you want somehow. The, the the causal cogs are not explained in any way, but it's thought that that's what you get. After all, a certain amount of spending gets has a certain amount of activity. Oh well, yes. An object can cast a shadow if there's a source of light, but the shadow is neither the source of light and the shadow is not the object. And it's a bit like that, in my view, with, with cash transfers, with spending. It's something we get as a result of production and valuing produce. So it's the old story. You make different products, you swap them. You want that, you want this, you want that. That's, a, that's simple and that's, that's all that's required by way of analysis. Here. They, they really are simply wrong to think that and we've now had, the hypothesis has been tested almost to destruction, as Stockman pointed out, because <laughs> there are trillions lying in reserves. And it's not rushing out to um, turn the wheels of industry. Why? Because as in the 30s, oh, and this is where Anna Schwartz and, 
of Freeman are wrong. They're one of the most famous works was the history of um, Manifest of the United, United States, indeed, where they pointed out, and I thought they were right for a while, that um, part of the reason for the downturn staying down so long in the 30s was because of the bank failures. Well, not simply that, but because of the money supply collapsed. But this money supply, and whatever it was at the time, um, ought to collapse. It was an effect. And it had causes, I suppose, if people didn't adjust to it. But there's no reason why they couldn't adjust to it. But the fact is, as now, pretty much, so things are now picking up, or I'll be having another boom you know, in property and housing and other things, stock markets. That the reason the money supply shrank was because the business was bad. It wasn't bad business because the money supply shrank. These things can feed on each other, but they don't necessarily have to. What happened was, as now, is that there are no decent people, to, people don't want to borrow. Some that do don't deserve to have anything. <laughs> They're just too risky. And the whole, the, the whole thing is working at a lower level, especially in the 30s in the world economy when prices fell by 10s, 20s, 30s. Unemployment, employment fell by 10, 20, 30 percent. But this wasn't simply because people weren't borrowing or there wasn't money to borrow or there weren't reserves. There were loads of reserves. I mean, in Canada, in Canada, not a bank failed. I might add, might add, they didn't have a central bank until later, didn't really need one. But they had branch banking in America, which meant that you weren't simply having the same old farmers with the same old crop who could all go bust together, as happened in many branches in America. But most of the bank failures were small in America, and, and, and that's not the real reason for the collapse in the money supply. That was simply that there were debts written off there were uh, debts called in, there were debts paid off, that was the reason, they were, and they weren't, they weren't replaced by more debt taken on, so of course, in that sense, that M, whatever it may be, figure would be much lower, but it was an effect, uh, not a cause. And from whatever level it, it was, given saving, flexibility as regard prices and wages, as happened in 1920, 21, in America, there was an enormous shock. They never tell you about it, of course. A massive collapse in prices and employment, and within 18 months, it was all back to normal and booming. And the government did nothing. <laughs> did nothing at all. Right, so um, Milton is still a kind of Keynesian, and he's still wrong. He thinks there should be a correct and different policy for each polity, in other words has to be modelling and uh, analysts and advisors and a central bank twisting, turning, adjusting. To conclude, oh, why not? Uh, Freeman is a mixture of good and bad. And that's not all bad. <laughs> um, it's better to be good and bad than bad and bad unless the net of the former is more bad than the sum of the two bads in the latter. Thank you. <laughs> is there any questions or contributions or criticisms? I hope there's no logician in the audience that says that a true and a false makes a false. <laughs> this, is, this is economic stuff logic. <laughs> it's David. Ah. Question. Is the net oh, in, good in his case. In his it's too early to tell. Was it Joe jo and Lai said that about the French Revolution? Or was it? Yes, <laughs> 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 I, I think it's he was a force for good in his in his uh, as as propagandist. As, in his propagandist, his advocacy work. Yes, yes. And some of his stuff about about licensing, the draft. He was right, right. Right, yeah. I like him I like him for that. And yeah, he's, he made a good son as well, which is... <laughs> no one could do that. Any more questions? Yes, you got it. Um, when when I, I listen to the free to choose, all the videos and stuff, when I see those things, I don't see that similar stuff 
in the modern times now, right now, like 1980s, and he was very brave and he he smashed everybody who criticized him. He was so good at every all the arguments. But maybe the right isn't quite well spoken these days. It feels like almost immoral to speak for the right. It's made, people have made it so immoral to be a capitalist. Do you agree with them? Because I'm an immigrant in this country, and I'm a, I used to be a scientist at UCL, and I'm a teacher now. All I see is leftist people around me, mm. especially in uh, school staff rooms. We oh, goodness, yes, yes. yes. We just, you're a bad guy if you say capitalism is good. Yes. So there's like really bad, um, Moral values attached to capitalism these days. Meanwhile, he made it; it's a moral good thing. But do you think perhaps there, there, needs, to be, there needs to be more people talking about capitalism and these are the good things and the economic case for it? And stuff? Well, it sort of happens by um, examples, as with China and India and elsewhere. They're finally wising up. They could have done it 50 years ago. There, they could have, should have done it 50 years ago, but they, but they didn't. So that's that's showing by um, by practice that. It, that it works. Also, um, uh, most I, I'm a libertarian, and most libertarians don't like the left-right thing. They think it it, it it confuses the issue more than it helps. So, um, in some respects, you can say I'm very left, I'm very right. There's like the meat round the back, and we can have um, the gentleman at the, the rear there would explain the lozenge system of um, or the north, south, east, west system of uh, locating the libertarians or the classical liberals. Um, it, it just you should just say that well, I believe in this. So, uh, Pretty voluntary, or a, a market order, or with voluntary bits on the side. There are various ways of doing it. Um, at, but you're right; people aren't advocating it quite the same way. But partly because it seems to have worked, you know, at least people learn from their mistakes. So there seems to be a great more market around the world than there was. And also, um, there's so much of the crony element that goes with the capitalism, which need, it need not. So, but the capitalism comes to being to mean actually existing capitalism, which is sadly cronified capitalism. Uh, you know, so, whereby regulators are captured by the things they regulate, or or they go, or they all go to the same universities and agree with the same stuff theories anyway. So, they don't have to be bribed; they're going to do the wrong thing anyway. Um, and the bailouts, well, meltdown, meltdown, <laughs> heavens are falling. Well, my view was. Uh, I think as the Swedes did, is it? you um, dismiss the heads of the banks. They get nothing, no bonus, no, no. go away. Um, the banks are uh, nationalised. I'm not arguing for this. I'm saying it's less, less bad than what was done. Um, uh, the money is saved below a certain sum, and then they later return to the market. That's what should have been done. That's what could have been done. A, a true catastrophe is when there's an epidemic or wars, or earthquakes, or volcanoes, or something, but merely that some banks behaved in ludicrous, an unsafe manner, and not surprisingly became a cropper. Well, so, in a sense, so what? I say this as a Lloyd's investor, <laughs> thanks to my dad, and uh, had a Lloyd's uh, uh, account as well. Um, but they could have done it so that anyone with less than, you know, Thirty thousand pounds or under was all right, and the rest could go whistle for it. It's your own fault for not paying attention <coughs> to what banks were doing. Of course, they might have led to rioting the streets or something. I don't know. But the fact is that the supposed appalling meltdown was a meltdown in what? In what? All the talents of the people were there. All the farms were still there. All the rivers ran down to the sea. I think still, even despite the monetary um, situation. No, you simply adjust apart from the problem, adjust to whatever, whatever money supply there is after this wreck. But the trouble is, because of the problem of massive indebtedness, in, in, much encouraged by all the monetary creation, that would have, could have caused all sorts of troubles. But it could be swift. I don't know how it would be done. I'm not, it's not, people work through these things somehow. But the idea that it was akin to you know, the end of civilization as we know it, just no, there's, there's plenty of money out there willing to f start a new bank or grow a, an existing bank. Or, so th that would have worked, could have been done, but wasn't done. They managed. I don't think it's so much cronyism. I think they just politicians just thought, oh, oh shit, pardon, you know, it's a technical term. Um, 
Oh, what was it? Bush the Younger said, this sucker's going down. <laughs> he said, of the, of the economy. Therefore, mm-hmm. um, things had to be done, and that, and that was an enormous bung to, uh, to the banks. Not that the government has a big box of money that it's put aside for a rainy day, as even Keynes used to think that they should do. In other words, in good times you save it up, and then better times you spend it. No, no, it's all, that's already got much spoken for and blown, and, and they're borrowing themselves. So as for the, as for the capitalism thing, um, I don't mind the word, but these, these, uh, these socialists want their rattle. Well, they want their little toy to play with. It's not fair that you won't let me call it capitalism. Call, call it the market process or something. I, I can't get excited about that. The market process doesn't wear a top hat and have a gold top cane and mm-hmm. stripy pants and things. No. Mm-hmm. So I'm not too fussed about the word, but you, sh- you should certainly argue for yeah, private property, private production, free exchange. Yeah. Pat? Uh, yeah, I, I'm surprised you, you didn't sort of examine uh, the, the Thatcherite take on Milton Friedman um, with, with her, you know, like, well, whatever you want to call it, but her take on what Friedman meant and uh, how, how to put things into practice. Mm-hmm. Um, they didn't get that much wrong. They her, her idea of market forces. There, there was another economist at the time, I forget his name now, it was Patrick something. Minford. Yes. Yes, he was a mother. He's still around today. I read, I read once, uh, many years ago, that um, Mrs. Thatcher, she wasn't that well up on economics, because she studied chemistry at Oxford. So she used to get this Patrick Minford around on a, a Sunday afternoon after she had Sunday lunch to teach her about economics. Yeah, that's reasonable. And it was rumoured that he thought that she had about GCSE level of economics. Well, she she led the she led the pack then. <laughs> <laughs> the politics. You only you only need GCSE level of economics. Yeah, yeah, that's that's just enough. After that, they start to go wrong. Yeah, well, that's yeah, right, yeah. I think you're correct there. Yeah. His sort of take on this uh, Friedman stuff was about she believed in market forces. Yes, I mean, I, I, everything I, I, everything she saw. I mean, literally everything was nothing was sold at the market price. I mean, it was a completely sort of warped idea. Well, except the council houses. Except? The council houses were sold no, below market, market prices. Price. Below. Well, below. Yes. People were buying their... Yeah, uh, I'm very pleased at that. People were buying their hundreds of I live in one. Pounds, yes. uh, houses for 20, for less than 20. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's good. Um, I mean... Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a good example. I, uh, yes, I, I like to refer to Margaret forces. <laughs> <laughs> No one ever said that. Well, no, yeah, because yeah. a lot of it was, well, yeah, of course, politics. Fair enough. But she she accepted that um, unemployment was not caused by a lack of you know, sort of insufficient inflation. That you know, either asking too much, or you're in a subsidised industry, or you should retrain to go somewhere else, or in the wrong part of the country, wherever it might be. And uh, it's not her being harsh. It's the circumstances being difficult for you. But that that just happens. It's what you're going to do. Change. You can't change the circumstances. With a wave of printing press, it's not so easy to do. I mean, certain things had to go. I mean, uh, Scarville said that the, you know, the, the, Tory, the Tories had a the Tories, the Tories had a hit list of mines that were going to close. It's not a hit list; it's a pencil and paper. You say, right, what's the price of the world coal? Uh, you can shovel it out of the ground in Australia. Here we have to dig enormous holes and go going for manual fracking. Which ought to be a good thing when miners did it. When it's hydraulic fracking, it's ought to be the um, appalling. It ought to be stopped. Anyway, the, so she did try and say, look, if it if it pays, it'll take care of itself. It'll need no subsidy. It'll need no. It will need nothing from me if it's worth doing. And of course, m- many of the coal mines were not worth having. But, so so there were, even the ones that were had to subsidise the ones that weren't, because all had to be in the bonus scheme. Which meant that mines that were losing money turned out more coal. And lost more money, so that that had to face reality eventually. Yeah. Well, it was I mean importing cheap coal, and it was all well and good. There's nothing wrong with that. But once the barriers have gone down between the two different countries, then it becomes a problem. Mm. That's it. Uh, any more? No, I'm not going to say any more. 
You don't want to that. <laughs> Any more? It was exhausting, didn't it? <laughs> Nothing to say? <laughs> well, thank you and good night. We'll continue <laughs> in the park. Yes. Any other? Uh, we shall. Uh,